to encourage our students to ask questions too. Our faculty always jump in um, with that because that's how engaged we are, but we really want to encourage students. We don't have to be ex expert in this area to have ideas and thoughts and, and questions. But this time we'll take your <laughs> I'm in a tug of war between you two. <laughs> um, well, I, I was going to say too that sometimes industry really gets a jump on on things because I've been approached at um, conference. I've been thrown off because I was at a scientific conference and get a, approached early on as soon as they see an abstract that has <laughs> hair dyes. Clairol is at my poster. Um, uh, or if I go to a conference on, and I think it's scientists and researchers on um, uh, somewhere where pesticides were raised once upon a time as a possibility, and there's an industry representative there. And I guess, how would you suggest that people respond to these well, early, early inquiries? So it's a, it's a fascinating problem in that right now, Juul is having trouble finding scientists who want to work for them and finding institutions who want to accept money from them. Because everybody knows that tobacco money is addictive, just like nicotine is addictive. I mean, you get money and you, you, know, you hire staff, and then you think, well, if I say this, if I say this, am I going to not get next year's funding? And it's it's very tough to do. And um, I think it's it's worthwhile to think about taking uh, industry money if it's set up in a certain way. It's you know, obviously, you have a right to publish. You know, they have no role in, in the design. But at the same time, you have to be aware that this could be a, a very short-term thing, and that's that's painful. But, and there are no easy answers to that. That's why there should be systems where, you know, industry puts money into a fund, and then the money is given out to researchers to do the research, who then aren't really, who's don't have to come back and worry about what they, the, if they find something positive, does that mean they'll never be funded again? That's what I'd like to see. So, Yes. Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I'm in the Environmental Health Science and Policy um, Program. Um, I really liked what you said about how we should regulate classes of chemicals rather than just individual ones. What do you think we as researchers, and especially as young researchers going out into the world of public health, how can we start to move that ahead if we're not directly policy people? Well, I think you could, you could write sort of reviews and sort of say, this is what we know, and this is what we don't know, pointing out what, you know, you, many of these reviews say, well, we know a lot about X, and then, but there are questions about this. And so the, the overall um, conclusion is that more research needs to be done. But that's a limited conclusion. I mean, the research, it's yes, we always need more research, but if you write and if, you know, in your thinking about this, you say, more research needs to be done, but based on what do we know now, um, and how should we ensure that people are properly protected on the basis of that knowledge? Do we have knowledge that's safe? Or do we have knowledge that certain exposures are safe? And you can look at, at least in terms of your reviews, very differently than, than some of those reviews I pointed out there, which they just say, well, we just don't know. I mean, I, you know, I could predict the findings of some of these consultant companies. They always say more research is needed, so therefore we shouldn't do anything. But I think you're, you can frame it very differently. And certainly, I mean, there are examples of this. The, you know, um, and I think people are getting this. The, there's been a petition to the Consumer Product Safety Commission to regulate organohalogen flavored targets as a, um, as a as a class rather than individually. Because it's the same thing. We know a lot about some of them, and they're really sort of very bad for uh, pediatric development. And we don't know about other ones. And at the big hearing, the, the guy who's now chairman of the um, of the Consumer Product Safety Commission said. <coughs> of the American Chemistry Council, can you give me any evidence these are safe? Any, any of these are safe. That's, you know, for two, he's been waiting for two years now. He hasn't gotten a response. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, so I think making sure we frame things that way is really important. Yes? Um, do you think, I know you said earlier on that, like, the Koch brothers obviously finance heavily into, like, finding abstracts like that. Well, not brother, I guess. Do you, do you um, okay. find... <laughs> Do you find that, because um, something like the overturning of Citizens United, for example, like, is there sort of a point at which you can run up against where, until public opinion really shifts and you can put out that there is sort of, you know, because it's the Supreme Court and then it needs to, you know, you'd be crazy, you know, it's very hard now to overturn that, so how do you? Well, there are different pieces of it, but clearly, I mean, one of the issues is really that we have a lot of legislators who, who 
sort of at least superficially buy into what the Koch brothers. And so I, I was uh, at a meeting with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who's a very outspoken uh, public health advocate. And I said, you know, what's, how is this possible? How do people you know, who you think are otherwise intelligent believe these things? And he said, it's all about money and citizens united. But it used to be, if you were a senator, it, you had a really terrible component of the job, which was begging for money. And you have to do that a lot less now, because that money pours in. But that's the, but the, the unstated quid pro quo is you, you, know, you buy into the regulations. Uh, so systems work certainly plays a role in that. Uh, I don't think that they're very effective in convincing the public, but um, but they're because I think there's already sort of this echo chamber of people who sort of put that out. But maybe Jeff has more thinking on this. So, uh, uh, Jeff I is a uh, guest here in this department. <laughs> He's with uh, uh, management, health policy management. So that's only happening here. A different model than for potentially paying industry money to support research would be through user fees. And so that's how some of the current NIH tobacco research is being funded through the user fees that the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry is paying to FDA, and that, that FDA translates and then transfers it. And so you can right, so the, but the, but the government is the fee. conduit, right? right? The government collects the right. money. That's right. And user fees. And launder is the money, right? But yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. Um, there is this a small free, small free foundation. Uh, and this is uh, this is, Mars. This is uh, the Derek Jack history. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and and the argument is that yes, he has any more money, but it is it is no strings attached. And the kind of arguments are extremely convincing. I think this is uh, this is a site that an initiative that talks a lot about your final points, and it's very difficult to, 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 to discuss this the last paper that he published at the beginning of the of the of this foundation and the continuous publications and funding that they are doing. It's extremely so this is a big debate within the public health community. Whether you know the Philip Morris funded a very large foundation run by a fellow who used to be really in charge of tobacco control at the World Health Organization, and then the question is: is, is it tainted money? Is it are there strings attached? Um, and I know that there's been a statement of many of the deans of school of public health saying, uh, "Don't touch the money." But there's a separation between is the money tainted because it's you know tobacco, which is worse than anything else, versus are there strings attached? And, and it's, it's a worthwhile discussion to have in it, on um, the ethics of it. And our school had been signed on. We're, yeah, of course, we're, we're assigned. Yes, you're in. My name's Brian. I'm in the school. And you're, you're in my class. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about the media's role in this. Yeah. Like, for example, last week they get me an email from the New York Times that red meat is, there's no proven like, health mm -hmm. effects to red meat. And then a week later, it, it like, just the kidding, response. the lead researcher had ties to meat industry. But like, what's the damage yeah. that's done during that week? I know that Absolutely. they love those headlines that yeah, undermine this trust. It's, it's very complicated, and reporters often, you know, they take the press release. They take the press release. Um, it's very, it's complicated. I don't know the answer to that. How you, how you, you know, I mean, you can't ask, I mean, it's hard enough for people who have degrees in public health to understand the science. Or to read the labels, but most people can't do that. I mean, you know, it's not, you can never, you can't ask me. So the government has to sort of step in and, and do the right thing, I think. Yes? Okay, uh, Jack Sandberg, can you go okay. um, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, that's my favorite role. Um, let's try two things. Jewel is instructive, vaping is instructive in the first place, because there is the argument that there's significant harm reduction. Right? That's I, 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 don't dis I don't disagree with that at all. <clears throat> so, so the argument that innocence, should not be assumed, right? Is therefore, if you if you say that you know, well, let's assume guilt and restrict any new chemical, you're you're restricting harm reduction. Now, I'll give you another example: genetically modified foods, right? These have genetically modified foods have the potential to feed a world that is stressed. And nutritionally, lots of people come after them and say, well, there there must be something wrong with them. We shouldn't presume them to be innocent before they're guilty. And so, to have to produce evidence, right? that something isn't harmful is much more difficult than producing evidence that something is harmful 
just throwing well, no, it. No, I, I think you raised two very important examples. And I think Juul's a great example. I think, I think e-cigarettes are fabulous for smokers. But the fact that, you know, that Juul is allowed to market them widely and, you know, the last survey was 3 million high school and, and middle school students smoked the e-cigarette in the last 30 days. I mean, the numbers are just off the charts. So you've got to, I, I'm not saying we should stop, we should forbid selling e-cigarettes, but I think, you know, we should have this discussion two years ago before they started selling or five years ago, watermelon flavor. <laughs> But we'd also know a lot more if, they did, if, if they OMB did. had not stopped the yes. gaming rule, if yes. FDA sought to regulate e-cigarettes. Under and, Obama. Under Obama. And, yeah. and it was stopped yes. under by the Obama right. OMB. Right. And if that rule had gone through, we'd know Absolutely. a whole lot more about what's in those right. chemicals that we do today. Right. And the same is true with GMO. I mean, I have no problem with, with selling GMO. For, I think they need to be heavily researched. But I think that's what we need to be doing, especially since it's going to be widely used and what people are going to have wide exposures. Um, because you, you, you can't prove the negative, but you could get a lot more evidence than we have on e-cigarettes, for example, because they just haven't done those studies. Yeah, that's going to be a long term. That's but they, but long it shouldn't have been. I mean, you should have done those studies before we, we yeah. went down that road. That's the problem. Um, it seems one of the dilemmas is there's a certain amount of trust that we put into these studies, right? that there's an honor system in the scientific community. Uh, one of those journals you mentioned, I'm actually published in, so is George, the regulatory uh, pharmacology, sure. et cetera. And at, it, even if I was reviewing that paper, the Volkswagen paper, um, I could not have known that one of the Volkswagen was rigged. I could not have known you know, a, a lot of aspects of that study. I just look at it, assess the general approach, the science, et cetera, and, sure. you know, and, and assess it that way. So it seems that it's easy to sort of set up a, how do you know, how do you know it's, when? There are uh, no easy answers here. But that's absolutely right. And you know, not every publication, not every article in regulatory toxicology, pharmacology is rigged at all. I mean, it's a lot of very, you know, normal, respectable, you know, mostly no offense, boring articles go in there. <laughs> 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 uh, how do you get how you get published. <laughs> 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 this is sort of the Paris School of Toxicology. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. But, so how do you how do you do that? That's the, but I think we need to have standards and we need to have a constant discussion about this. But sponsorship is really important, obviously. It's financially conflict of interest is really an important question that we pay for. Can I guess one quick question? So how do I know when uncertainty is manufactured and when it's real? Well, so like, are eggs good for me, or is pig egg? Well, that's the big yeah, response. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what's really important is you have to have um, as much as you can to have um, authoritative, independent bodies review this. Now, there, the literature is going to change, but you certainly don't want people with an axe to grind being part of that discussion. We're doing the, the advertising of it. I mean, there's no, I don't know the answer to that, but it, and you have to, you have to try to look it out. It's not clear. But sometimes, it's, but it's very different when you're talking about a product like eggs, which have, you know, if they're around, people are going to eat them. Widespread exposure and all those things you're just talking about. Yeah. And like, are they? We presume they're good. Yeah. Well, there's been a big fight over this. Who do you attribute? Who do you blame for heart disease? Right. Right. That's, yeah. No. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what, where are the best places to go to do your independent research on the researchers of these oh, articles? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, but I always do, the first thing I always do when I read a, a paper that says, looks a little fiction to me is I go to the University of California, San Francisco Tobacco Legacy Library, and I see if, if that researcher was working for the tobacco industry. Which it always, and it, you, you can't believe what you find in there. And you say, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, and that's not just positive because, you know, there are various reasons people work for tobacco or not, but at least that tells you. There, there's no one answer, but it's certainly, it's important to sort of look at who's paying for it, what other studies they've done. And that's what came up in this meat study that, um, in New York, that some people said, you know, if you look back just a couple of years, um, this researcher, who's a Canadian researcher, was working for the International um, Life Sciences Institute, which actually has some very good people working for them. but. He was really promoting sugar, you know, the, the, the non-hazardous nature of sugar. And this was five years ago, and now he's doing this. So that's why people are saying, well, you know, 
is he is this an honest review? I can't answer that, and you have to sort of dig into it. But the fact that he didn't um, or that didn't come out in the first one is what sort of causes all this confusion. Where someone comes back and says, well, he was working with this ILSI. This ILSI group was set up by Coca-Cola, and the, the vice president of Coca-Cola was the, the